I'm David Ireland. Welcome to another Wildlife Man adventure. In this episode, we will explore some of the most remote wilderness in Australia and encounter some strange insects and snakes, some of them highly dangerous. And then we will go diving and attempt to hand feed some of the fastest ambushing sharks on the planet. So join me on my latest exciting adventure. The Blue Mountains are part of the Great Divining Range that runs almost parallel to the east coast of Australia. This huge sandstone plateau was laid down over 500 million years ago when an inland sea covered huge areas of mainland Australia. The mountains represent the highest biodiversity in temperate forests in the world. The diversity of life and scenery here is breathtaking. Australia has some of the oldest land formations on the planet. And this place is special. It's special for two main reasons. One, the scenery. As far as I can see, there are huge sandstone escarpments. And that beautiful blue colour you see is actually eucalyptus oil that's evaporating from a billion trees. The other reason why this place is so special is because of the animals. This one up here. Now this is a tawny frogmouth. Oh, hello. And I should be able to get pretty close because these animals don't consider man to be a threat. And the first thing you notice about this beautiful boy is look at the coloration. That mottled silver feathers. They perfectly match the bark of the tree. So you could easily walk right under a tree and have one of these guys there and you would never see it. These animals are very owl-like but they're not actually an owl at all. They don't have the big, powerful, curved talons of owls, and the beak is much softer. But they are predators. They're nocturnal predators, and you can see that by the huge eyes. What they mostly hunt is things like small mammals, like a mouse, and also insects. And they are such clever flies that they can even catch a moth on the wing very special animals and if I'm very gentle because they don't fear people he might just let me pat him. Hello mate, you are so special aren't you? What a magic place. Leave you alone. To increase my knowledge about the strange insects we seek in these mountains, I have joined the mini beast expert, Jackie Love. She makes her living by teaching school children about the wonderful world of insects. Is there? Oh, there it is. <laughs> you told me this morning that as long as you don't actually put pressure on a spider, they can walk over your hand without biting you. That's right. Um, especially species like huntsmen's, they would prefer to run away. Prefer know, to run away. Than, than bite. They use biting as a last resort. Now, huntsmen are not that venomous, but it's still a, a nasty sting, isn't it? That's right. I mean, they still have two little fangs, and they still have some venom. Yeah. Um, so they're not considered dead, deadly or dangerous. Sure. But they well, certainly still can give you a bite. Well, I'm going to try and see if what you told me works. And if it bites me, I'm going to be upset. Yeah. 
And we'll just see if we can get this spider to walk over my hand. There we go. Oh, look at you. Now these huntsmen, what do they mostly feed on? They prey on other insects, do they? Yeah, especially like when they're up in the trees and under bark, they'll eat a lot of bark dwelling insects like wood moths and bark cockroaches. Okay. But they will eat pretty much anything that they, you know, they can catch. Yeah. We might let this one go back to the bark <laughs> before it gets upset. There we are. Most insects in the Australian bush are secretive creatures and harmless to humans, but some species are dangerous and can deliver a painful and even fatal sting. Now, I don't mind hand feeding sharks. And I'm quite comfortable picking up a death adder. But what's under this rock really has me a bit nervous. And I'm not even sure how I'm going to show it to you. Alan, can I have that stick? Please, thank you. We'll just see if we can get him to get onto a stick so I can show you one of the most dangerous predators in the insect world. Now, come here, don't you bite me. Look at that. This is a giant centipede. And these creatures are absolutely amazing predators because they are so powerful and so venomous, they can even kill the most dangerous spiders in Australia. Look at this creature. Each one of these legs actually has a claw so they can dig that in to prey and hang on with amazing strength. Under the head are modified legs or claws if you like that also act like fangs that deliver a lethal dose of venom. They can kill funnel web spiders, bird spiders, even scorpions. They are so deadly. In fact, there's even been a report of a human fatality from one of these giant centipedes. Look at him. And I can't pick this guy up with my hands because it's segmented. If I try and hold it by the tail, it will just simply wrap around and get hold of, hold of me like that. <laughs> it really does have an attitude. This is a bad thing, I tell you, look at it. Look, look at him. See him swinging that head to try and attack. Look, when I touch him, trying to bring those fangs into play. Look, oh, isn't that incredible? Now I'm gonna bring him up nice and close so you can have a look at a giant centipede. Isn't that incredible? Look at that animal. If you're camping in the Australian bush, one thing that I recommend is you bring your boots inside the tent. Because if you leave your boots outside and one of these giant centipedes gets inside your shoe, in the morning you're in for a very painful day. Look at this amazing, beautiful creature. Now we're gonna put you back under your rock because one thing giant centipedes don't like is too much heat from the sun. So we'll put him back in under the rock. Australia's isolation has allowed the evolution of many endemic creatures. The centipede kills its prey by stinging. Some predators here kill by constriction. Uh, look what we've got up here. If I can just get up here. Come here, 
you beautiful creature. Now, if I could just get this down. Look at this beautiful animal. Come on, down you come. You gotta be famous. We're gonna show you to the whole world, you wonderful predator. Don't bite me, don't bite me. Come down, come down. Come on, come down, don't be bad. Come on. Oh, look at you, come out, come out. There we go. Look at this beautiful animal. Marilia spilota, which is, of course, the carpet python. These are wonderful Australian predators. They have excellent eyesight, and when they stick their tongue out, don't you mess up and bite me. They can pick up scent particles in the air. They also have heat sensing pits in the sides of their mouth. So this snake can go right up into a tree, the arboreal. He can go into the hollow of a tree and pick up the heat of animals like birds, ringtail possums, and sugar gliders. So they're very clever predators. But see this essing up now, that's dangerous because these wild snakes can strike. And they often eat things like rats. And when they do, they like to, don't you think about it. Don't you even think about it. When they eat a thing like a rat, they like, don't, uh, uh. They like to swallow their prey head first. So the last thing over the, the teeth of this animal is the rat's bum. Don't, so the bacteria is on the teeth. If they bite, you can get nasty infections from a bite from a wild python. Don't you even think about it. If you bite me on the nose, my credibility is gone. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh. don't. Now you know what's so beautiful about this animal? Look at the shining scales in the late afternoon sun. Look at them, they're just glistening in the sun. What a beautiful creature. You want to go back to your tree? All right. Up you go and I'll leave you alone. There we go. Back in your tree. Ah, how good is that? Springtime is a time of plenty. Plants multiply by seeding and flowering. As the warmer weather heats the woodlands, creatures that burrow deep into sandy soil to escape the winter chill now begin to stir. I'm going to show you some very special bush tucker. Have a look down here. Now if you look really closely, you can see that something is moving in this sandy loom. Look at that. This animal is a macropan estea which is actually a giant cockroach. In fact, it's one of the largest species of cockroach in the whole wide world. And I have to be a bit careful handling it because their mouth parts can bite. If I can just get it out, hopefully it won't bite me. Look at that. Don't bite me, please. Look at the size of this animal. The beauty about these giant cockroaches is that they are highly nutritious. And also, you can eat them raw, and that's exactly what I'm gonna do. The only problem is, because of those mouth parts, when I put it in my mouth, I'll have to bite down and kill it quickly, otherwise it'll bite a piece out of my tongue. So here we go, I'll show you how to do it. Ah, 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 ah. Don't you bite me, don't bite. The trick is to get it in your mouth and bite the head off very quickly. I'm only joking. <laughs> These giant cockroaches live in sandy loom and they're probably quite a common species, but we hardly ever see them because not many people dig down in the sand. Now these huge cockroaches are very different to their European cousins. They're not a pest and they don't carry disease. In fact, these animals, 
play a very important role in the environment because they feed on leaf litter and they return the nutrients back to the soil. But I have to be a bit careful handling it because the mouth parts can bite and also if I drop the animal it would die. So they need to be handled very carefully. So we'll return this giant Australian cockroach back to his sandy loom. There you are mate. I'm sorry if we disturbed you. You are quite amazing. Springtime regeneration of plants and shrubs attracts phasmids or leaf eating insects. They come down from the forest canopy to feed. For animals to survive in the wilderness, they need shelter, they need food, they need a chance to reproduce, and they also need to avoid being preyed upon by predators. Some creatures avoid detection by literally disappearing into the environment, especially creatures like this. Now this animal here is a goliath stick insect. And if I very gently remove this beautiful creature, I can show you. Now look at that. How wonderful is this animal? This is a female. You can see by the, the very heavy body and the small wings, she is definitely girl. The females can't fly. She will spend her time up in the foliage feeding. She gives off or emits pheromones, which are, if you like, female perfume into the air. If she's lucky, the scent will be carried into the trees and attract a male. A male comes and mates with her, 50% of her offspring will be male. Now, an interesting thing about these amazing creatures, they are parthenogenetic, which means that if the male takes too long to come around, that she can self-fertilize. The penalty she pays is then 95% of her offspring will be female. Look at this wonderful, wonderful creature. And she's not real happy right now <laughs> because she's probably been giving off pheromones all day and all she attracted was an old bushman, me. And I apologize for that. I'll put you back, I know, hitting me on the nose. I'll put you back in the tree and hopefully you'll attract a male, another goliath stick insect. Look at this beautiful thing. Look at her. All right, we'll put you back in your tree. You can have some more wattle to feed on. See you later, darling. When there's very strong winds in the bush, arboreal or tree dwelling creatures get literally blown out of the canopy and then they fall to the forest floor. They are then exposed to a whole raft of predators. So the challenge for them then is to avoid detection and to try and get back up into the canopy as quickly as they can. Animals like these avoid detection by having wonderful camouflage. Look at this. This gorgeous creature is, come here, come here, I'm not gonna hurt you. Let go, let go. Is a spiny stick insect. What a wonderful thing, look at that. Now they get their coloration from the foliage that they eat. So if they're feeding on, on gum leaves, eucalyptus leaves or wattle, they can change their colour slightly depending on their food source. The animal is very much stick-like. So when they're up in the canopy, they're almost impossible to see. They mimic the leaves. An interesting thing about these spiny stick insects is you can see that all over their body, 
there are hundreds of little tiny, very sharp spines. Now they would give them some defence against predation by animals like kookaburras and magpies. In fact, when they curl that tail up like that, it looks like a dead leaf. Some people believe they're actually mimicking a scorpion. I'm not sure about that. By the little tiny wings, obviously they can't fly. But all those hundreds of very sharp little spines will help them to protect themselves from predation by birds. But I'm not so sure that they'd protect them from snakes or lizards. If they saw them, they'd probably eat them pretty quickly. Look at this beautiful little thing. Spiny stick insect. Now it'll probably wait till nightfall before it starts climbing back up into the canopy. So we'll put you back on the tree, mate. Look how well it blends into the bark. Look at that. And now we're getting the swaying thing happening again. Hey, I'm a leaf, I'm a leaf. I'm not really an animal. Look at that. Looks like it might be on its way back up. Good luck. Stick insects rely on their camouflage to avoid predation by birds. Other insects escape detection during daylight hours by burrowing or hiding under rocks. However, turning over rocks looking for insects should be done with caution in Australia's outback. Now when the early prospectors worked these valleys from Sephala all the way up into the Bathurst country looking for gold, they would have turned over countless rocks. They also would have encountered some very dangerous creatures, especially snakes and the animal that is under this rock. And I'm going to try and show it to you. Now. I do not. Whoa, look at this guy. This is a giant desert scorpion and I don't suggest anyone try and do what I'm doing. And that is pick one up by the stinger. Ah, this guy's got my heart beating because I know if I get stung, I'm going to spend a number of days in hospital. These scorpions are nocturnal hunters and they, they mostly hunt things like millipedes and spiders. They grab hold of their prey with these very powerful pincers here and then they repeatedly strike the venom into their victim. When they kill their prey, they actually excrete digestive juices onto the prey and then they ingest the animal. That's a little bit like me vomiting on a hamburger, waiting 20 minutes and then eating it, which is rather disgusting. In this rocky country, they'll hide under rocks, but in the loose red soil, they'll dig burrows right down to six feet, that's two meters or more to escape the sun. They're very much nocturnal predators. And you can see I'm holding that stinger very carefully. Now, we're going to put you back there. Brett Towsell, a friend and experienced reptile handler, assists me to plan an expedition to search for a rare snake. A snake that flattens its neck like the king cobra. Brett's local knowledge of these mountains is invaluable. True Wilderness is shrinking worldwide. Exploring pristine virgin bushland is an absolute privilege. And the best chance of snake encounters is always in undisturbed habitats. Now many of the valleys and deep gorges of the Blue Mountains are inaccessible to four-wheel drives and even on foot. But canoeing will allow us to gain access to some of the most remote wilderness in Australia.
Oh, look what we've got here. Oh, ho, ho, ho. look at the way this snake is hooding up. See, it's flattening the back of its neck. Pseudicus guttatus. This is a blue-bellied black snake. And a dangerous snake to humans because the venom can cause massive tissue and organ damage. So it's not a, not a, a good snake to step on in the bush. These snakes love the dry, arid conditions on top of these escarpments. And I'll try and pick him up, but it's, it's not easy. It's a dangerous animal to pick up. And I don't suggest anyone tries to. It's very, very specialised. OK, we've got you. We've got you. Now look at this wonderful, wonderful animal. Now being in a leopard, of course, the fangs are in the front of the top jaw and they can strike very quickly. The unpredictable snake. The interesting thing about this animal is look at the coloration. If I lie him down on this leaf litter and this black soil, he just disappears. So it is not an easy snake to see. It's well camouflaged. And you're getting a bit stroppy, and I'm going to leave you alone. But just one thing before I go. Look at the, these black scales just glistening in the Australian sun. What a wonderful predator. I'll bring you a little bit closer for my audience to see. Don't you bite me. Don't you bite me. All right, all right, all right, all right. Be gentle. There. Oh, okay, I can let you go. Off you go, mate. Now it's time to leave these mountains and encounter some unique Australian marine animals. Jarvis Bay is on the south coast of New South Wales. This popular holidaying and diving destination is the deepest sheltered harbour in Australia. Hopefully here, we will get a chance to hand feed one of the fastest ambushing sharks in the world, the Wobbegong. We've joined Martin from Sea Sports. He knows Jarvis Bay better than anyone. But Martin warns me they have not seen many Wobbegong sharks lately. Literally thousands of Wobbegongs have been caught for human consumption and this worries me greatly. With our bulky high definition cameras, Mark and I prepare to die. The reef here is alive with colour. Sponges and sea tulips are everywhere. They filter the ocean for plankton sized food. Palm-sized cephalopods, or cuttlefish, are here also. The waves of colour flashing over their skin depicts their mood. Chromatophores control the pigment cells in their skin. These highly developed mollusks always fascinate me. The extremely rare blue devilfish adds splendour to this reef. But what interests me most are the weedy sea dragons. These delicate cousins to the seahorse reproduce like no other fish. The female transfers eggs to a brood pouch under the male's tail and he fertilises and incubates the eggs. After a few months, some 200 tiny dragon-like creatures hatch. This blazing red female is unconcerned by my lights. She is busy hunting. Her long, spotted snout sucks in tiny shrimp-like myriads. She is delicate, but also an efficient predator.
There are no wobbegongs, but Port Jackson sharks are everywhere, all with one thing on their mind, mating. Luck is with us as I manage to film for the first time in my life the act of copulation. We discover a wobbegong shark inside a cave. I try and attract the shark out by shaking a fish bait but my bait attracts a monster instead. A huge, giant cuttlefish makes numerous attempts to steal the bait. He can take a piece out of a diver with his powerful beak. So catching him is not without risk. I'm keen to let Mark film this giant cephalopod, but the cuttlefish has other ideas and clouds the ocean in ink. Now this time of year, Heterodontus Port Jacksoni, or Port Jackson sharks, congregate in large numbers. Now unlike most sharks, Port Jacksons give birth to an egg case. Now once the little baby Port Jackson hatches from the egg case, for many years we had no idea where they went to. But now we know. Under the boat here, in about 10 metres of water, anchored off this beautiful little beach in Jervis Bay. The whole seabed is carpeted with hundreds and hundreds of little baby Port Jackson sharks. So come with me, we're about to see the cutest little sharks you've ever seen in your whole life. On the sandy seabed, baby Port Jackson sharks are everywhere. Why they congregate here is a mystery. Never before have I seen or filmed such an event. These tiny sharks are so vulnerable to predation. Probably only one in 20 will ever make it to adulthood. Hopefully this little fella will be lucky and like his parents, get a chance to mate in the calm waters of Jarvis Bay. With few wobbegongs encountered at Jarvis Bay, we decide to travel to Stradbroke Island in southern Queensland. A known breeding ground for wobbegong sharks. On our way north, we stop at the mouth of Lake Macquarie. Here, tidal flows carry nutrient-rich water under the Swansea Bridge. The habitat is famous for huge octopus. We'll just have to wait till the current stops and we'll have a window of about 30 minutes to dive in there. So we only have a 30 minute chance right. to dive. After getting some local knowledge from the manager of AquaZero Dive Shop, we once again descend underwater. Under the bridge, fantail leather jackets browse the thick cover of soft corals for food. An extremely rare pinecone fish shelter under the concrete slabs. Their scales show the reason for their name.
hiding under the shadow of the bridge. Huge octopus mimic the colours of the strap grass. These highly intelligent predators respond to being handled in numerous ways. This one fans his body like an umbrella, hoping to intimidate me with his huge size. To reassure him I intend no malice, I remove my glove. Octopus are tactile creatures that can be calmed with the gentle touch of human skin. I pick up a much smaller octopus and notice this one needs medical attention. Uh, I brought you a beautiful, beautiful animal. This is my friend, I just found him. And he has a problem. Can you see the hook? Yep. There we are. Now. Come on. I know it hurts. There. I got it. There's that horrible stainless steel hook. Why we use stainless, I don't know. After two days driving, we arrive at Stradbroke Island on the ferry. Stradbroke is only a few kilometres offshore from the mainland. And offers some of the best diving in southern Queensland. We join up with Steve McKinnon, the owner of Straddy Dive. His knowledge of the offshore reefs is legendary. It is here we hope to hand feed the sharks of ambush. Steve McKinnon launches his boat by using a tractor. Many boats have come to grief in the surf here. But with my old mate Steve at the helm, we navigate safely out to sea. A mix of both temperate and tropical currents wash over the reefs here. Soft corals and anemones take full advantage of plankton-laden currents. There is plenty of food for the resident turtles. But this very old one is finding swimming extremely difficult. His shell and skin are covered in barnacles that greatly increase the drag. This ancient mariner is near the end of his days. I gently pick up a puffer fish to demonstrate its defences. He quickly inflates his body with water. Almost no creature could swallow him now. Handling these strange fish can be dangerous. The powerful jaws and cutting teeth can easily shear off a diver's fingers. When I release him, he deflates quickly and swims off wondering what I was. As we explore deeper, we encounter numerous species of wobbegong sharks. The sharks of ambush are here in good numbers. Two metre spotted wobbegong is resting in a gutter. Unlike most sharks, she does not need to continually swim to oxygenate her gills. Although she seems docile, she can snap her lethal jaws with lightning speed. So patting her 
is risky. It's time now to surface and get the baits we need to hand feed these amazing predators. Now our goal is to get the Wobbegong shark protected and also to aid scientists with much needed data about their prey and also their hunting techniques. Now to do so, we will attempt to hand feed all three species of Wobbegongs with different types of fish and record their preferences. Now what we're about to attempt is extremely dangerous and I'll show you why. These are the jaws of a four foot long Wobbegong shark and you can see there are six rows of needle sharp teeth and they all face backwards. The jaws are driven by very powerful muscles. In fact, the muscle power of the Wobbegong shark's jaws rivals that of a crocodile. Once a Wobby snaps its jaws shut, it's almost impossible to prise them open. I do not want to get my hand inside the jaws of a Wobbegong shark. The task before us is daunting. The current is getting stronger. Visibility is being reduced by the sediment. To add to our woes, poisonous needle urchins fill every crevice. It will be hard to avoid the painful spines while my attention is on hand feeding hungry sharks. Wobbegong sharks are being devastated by commercial fishing and need urgent protection status. Little is known about their preferred diet. Gaining this data is highly dangerous. As Steve McKinnon shakes the chum bag, anything could turn up. Even a great white or bull shark could be attracted. A dwarf ornate wobbegong arrives unnoticed. His coloration perfectly matches the sea floor. He tears the fish in half and then swims between my legs and off down the reef. A more powerful spotted wobbegong arrives. As he swallows it down, I sneak a dangerous pat. Surprisingly, some fish are rejected. It is important we learn what prey these sharks prefer. If we are ever going to successfully protect the Wobbegong, their prey must also be protected from overfishing. We change baits. Again and again, I'm left in a cloud of blood, trying desperately to see what is coming next to snatch a fish from my hand. Now I deliberately challenge the sharks by refusing to let go. Their reaction is mixed. Some tug for a while, then surprisingly give up. Like us, they have different personalities.
some shark refuse to let go and wrench the fish from my hand, whilst other sharks demonstrate their dominance and thrash the bait to pieces. To many people, a shark is a violent animal, when in fact their behaviour is a result of millions of years of evolution. They are not evil creatures, rather masters of survival. I feel an urchin's spine puncture my knee. The pain is intense, but I must not look down. The smell of the baits is attracting larger sharks from the depths. They exceed two metres. An accidental bite could easily sever arteries. existence of these sharks is paramount to the future survival of many of the seafloor dwelling animals of Australia.